Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about anaesthesia. There is so, so much we could talk about with anaesthetics. People will dedicate their entire professional lives to the subject, but we're going to try to do it justice in just a couple of minutes. Anaesthesia is rendering one of our patients unconscious and physically relaxed in order to get a job done. You could alternatively describe it as taking a controlled meander from consciousness towards death and back again, but that would do absolutely nothing to reduce anybody's fears and anxiety about the topic. And anaesthesia is often approached with a certain amount of trepidation by the general public. Anaesthetics simply switch off the conscious centres of the brain. Now, if you use quite a lot of them, you could theoretically switch off all the centres of the brain, but that is obviously something that we don't want to do terribly often. And that's the difference between an anaesthetic drug that's relatively safe and one that is not. We often talk about different planes of anaesthesia, specifically the anaesthetic getting deeper as we get closer to death. Most of the time, we want to keep our patients somewhere in the surgical anaesthesia plane. At this stage, they're not feeling anything. They don't have any muscle tone. They don't even blink if you touch their eyelids, but they will blink if you touch their eyeball. And it's still perfectly reversible. The cardiovascular system is still working reasonably well and they're still breathing on their own. If you go a bit deeper than that, you can still recover them but if you keep going too deep, then you're obviously not. So the way anaesthetics work is actually really interesting because while you would expect a lot of it is related to metabolism, whether the patient is awake or deep is often related to the anaesthetics redistribution in the body. We could talk for a long time about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, but I'm gonna try and keep it nice and quick and simple for you. In most cases, we would use an injectable anaesthetic first. This is for ease of use, so that we can then get the endotracheal tubes in and maintain our patient on a gas anaesthetic. So in theory, or at least according to the plan, all of the anaesthetic is injected straight into the bloodstream. And from there, because it's attracted to fat molecules, it will leave the bloodstream and go into both the brain, which is mostly fat, and actual plain old fat tissue. Then remember chemistry talking about equilibrium equations? These things go both ways. So it will over time, maybe 15, 20 minutes, dissolve back out of the brain into the blood and out of the fat into the blood and back again. So what this means is that your initial injection may well go to the brain very quickly and induce anesthesia but over the next few minutes, it's going to start coming out and it's going to basically accumulate in the fat. Now, what this means for something like a greyhound, which doesn't have terribly much fat, is that compared to a, another dog breed, like a Labrador or a Jack Russell, it's going to have more anaesthetic that gets stuck in the brain. And so its anaesthetic is going to be longer and it's going to have a harder time recovering. Some of this anaesthetic will also go to liver and kidneys to be metabolized and cleared, but that's not usually how they wake up. That often happens over several days afterwards, which is part of the reason why historically nobody was super keen to do a general anaesthetic every single day for a patient. Modern drugs are a lot safer and a lot easier to use in that way if you have to. Now our inhalation anaesthetics work in a very similar way. The gas is breathed in and it goes from the lungs into the bloodstream where it then gets redistributed to both fat and brain. And then as part of its equilibrium, it also comes out of fat and brain and then it gets breathed out. So our gaseous anaesthetics are actually hardly metabolized at all in order for the patient to wake up, it just has to start breathing no more anaesthetic. 
which is why we use it so that we can fine tune it as we go along. It's very easy to just turn a dial to dial the anesthesia up or down, depending on where the patient is in its depth, and it's fairly quick to respond. You just have to keep them breathing. So lots and lots of people, especially breeders or fans of purebred animals, will like to say that their breed is somehow extra sensitive to anaesthetics. A lot of the time that isn't strictly the case. There are a couple of general rules though. Animals that have low body fat, like the greyhounds, the sighthounds, but also very young immature animals or very sick animals, have less fat in which to have the injected anaesthetics accumulate to allow them to regain consciousness. They could be considered to be sensitive to anaesthetics. Also animals with impaired liver and kidney function would be particularly sensitive because the injectable anaesthetics have to go through the liver or the kidney to ultimately be cleared from the system, even if the animal regains consciousness before that. So breeds that are prone to liver dysfunction, for example, would be considered somewhat vulnerable to those anaesthetics. Brachycephalic animals are another group. They often have an abnormal vagal tone, and so their heart rates can be a little bit strange to start with, and that just makes them more vulnerable to the side effects of anaesthesia. Now, lots of people will talk about side effects in anaesthesia and its risks. Um, the people that promote anaesthesia-free dentals, for example, will often vilify it, even though look, we've been doing this for an awful long time. We've got lots and lots of drugs. Yes, it's very easy to go down too far to where you kill a patient with anesthesia, but we've all had lots and lots of practice. Like we're pretty good at controlling this these days. So to the point where I don't have too many concerns about anesthetizing even old patients or old patients that are somewhat sick. There are precautions you take but our unexpected anaesthetic deaths are relatively rare. So in vet medicine, we would probably be talking about maybe one in 10,000 cases that has an adverse reaction, which can include death, but is not just limited to death. At least in the small animal side, horses have it a bit rougher on account of being huge, enormous, flighty, dangerous creatures anyway. Human medicine often reports an adverse reaction rate of about one in a hundred thousand. But uh, humans kind of cheat because their anaesthetists will swiftly palm their patients off to ICU and if it dies in ICU, it doesn't count. So how do we reduce our risks for anaesthesia? Well, the number one thing that we can do to make these things as safe as possible is patient monitoring. An anaesthetic isn't set and forget. You always keep checking to make sure they're exactly where you want them and not drifting too far towards that point of no return. All the tools are great. All the machines that go ping and tell you how often it's breathing and what its blood pressure is and its core body temperature and its heart rate and all of that is great but nothing is quite as good as a qualified nurse. You just can't replace the human. Because sometimes machines are wrong. Also the drugs we use these days are a lot safer than they used to be 10 or, or even 20 years ago. It's still routine advice after a procedure to warn owners that their pet might be a bit tired that night, might not want to eat until the next morning, and it's perfectly normal for them to sleep a lot. And then out walks the patient, bright and bouncy and happy as though nothing has happened, and they think that I was just mad for saying it might be quiet. That's because the older drugs did have more of a hangover effect than the modern ones do. Anesthesia should always be approached with respect. It's not necessary to fear it as such, because in practice, we use it a lot. 
we've got lots and lots of practice with it. We're extremely familiar with what it looks like. And so we control it very well. It lets us do the jobs that need to be done, minimizing fear and stress for our patients. So while treated with respect, it doesn't necessarily have to be feared. It's a, it's a little bit magic when, it, when you really think about it because we are trying to bring this animal very close but not quite to death and then back again like nothing had happened. And we do it every working day. And thanks for listening. Oh, and Wonka says hi. <laughs>